this, well, I can show for that even, which Kristen talked about what we're going to talk about all semester. Anybody know what we're talking about? Yes? Um, you've heard it said, but what does the Bible say? Yeah, okay, so it's this Sermon on the Mount series, if you will, long term. We're going to just spend a lot of time in Matthew 5 through 7. And so Shannon took the Beatitudes, which are at the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, and it talks a lot about, you know, here are the blessings that come with um, following Jesus. And what is that? And she kind of unpacks them. I understand. Uh, today, I'm actually going to work in reverse. So rather than going, I'm not going to go in order probably. You'll, you'll want to spend time in the text and you can figure out what you can talk about some different things. And I'm actually picking something from the very end. Um, and there's a reason for that. So I'm, I'm choosing um, a section at the end because it's going to tell us why what we're about to talk about for the whole year or however long, why it matters, um, and why these different things that Jesus says matter, and why the way we live matters. So if the Sermon on the Mount is kind of this prescription for holy living, and it's this prescription for how do we live in a, an un unholy world, and why does it look different, and um, you know what does Jesus ask of us, then, then this is going to kind of give us the context of why that matters. Um, so, um, you know, in the Sermon on the Mount, one of the things that Jesus challenges us, um, he challenges us to be perfect in word, um, in deed, in the way we think, uh, and act. And so, so that's obviously impossible for us. Um, and so we're trying to figure out but how do we make an attempt and, and what are we doing. Um, so this morning, the You Heard It Said is um, going to address a cultural assumption, but it's actually one that is going to maybe be surprising. I would say to you, if you've heard it said, ask Jesus into your heart. Um, but I would say to you, fall in love with Jesus and live a life of repentance. And some of you are probably like, hmm, ask Jesus into your heart. Sounds like something that's good. This sounds like something that I've been told my whole life. This sounds like something that probably one of us has, or all of us, has said to you, yes, you just need to ask Jesus into your heart. You're probably saying, Rachel, like, sounds a little heretical, whatever you're about to tell me, because you're saying that, um, you know, ask Jesus in your heart, that's what we need to, to accept Christ. We just pray this prayer, we say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner, and you died for me, and you rose from the dead, and please forgive me, and, and that's it, you're good, you got to check. Um, and so, I, I thought it would be good to kind of address and see what does Jesus say uh, about that. And so we're going to look at Matthew 7. I'm going to start in verse 15 um, to begin with. So I'm going to pull that up on the screen. Um, watch out. This is Matthew 7, verse 15. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. This is a really hard text. It's hard for, for me to grasp because especially that second part when it's talking about true and false disciples. It's like these are all good things. Like this it would seem like that fruit that the first section talked about. Like what is the fruit of loving Jesus and knowing him? It's that you go to revolution and you um, try to be kind to your brother and sister and you try to have these great mission moments in church, at school and kind of wherever you're at. Um, so it's hard then to read that second section and say, wait a second, why does the Lord say, many people say to me, didn't we do all this? And he'll say, I never knew you. Um, and so that's something that's kind of, um, as somebody who grew up in the church and somebody who's grown up being taught, here's what you need to do to be a Christian and here's how you should act as a result, that's kind of hard to hear. Um, and so what I would say is before this all these things we're going to tell you all semester about how to live and kind of the practical, how do you deal with this issue or that issue. Um, before you address those, your heart has to be changed. And it's nothing that you can do. Um, 
And it's nothing that, that is um, pending on the way that you act or the way that you, um, you know, do your, go about your life. Your time at Revolution, your time here at church, your hours committed in the community will not save you, but it does matter at the same time. And so it's kind of a paradoxical situation. And so we're, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, those things do matter. Your fruit does matter, but it's only when your heart is already transformed. So um, in John 3, the, the word tells us that no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. And in our Christian world, oftentimes that's been translated into you must pray the prayer and, and that's how you get born again. Uh, so I'm telling you that Jesus is kind of meant more in that than just saying a prayer. Uh, he's really challenging you to change everything that you do about life, but it's because he's changed you. It's not something that you do on your own or you're going to muster up the courage to do and grit your teeth and change. Um, he, your heart of stone, my heart of stone, our filth and evilness is going to be replaced by one that, that loves him, and one that beats for him, but it's something that he does. And, it's, and so if you only take one thing away from the rest of what I say today, take that ask the Lord to change your heart of stone. Ask the Lord to give you a heart that, that loves him. Ask the Lord because it's the Lord who does it. And it's the Lord who works and it's the Lord who brings about fruit in your schools and it's the Lord who brings about fruit when you go to revolution. Um, so that would be my thing. Ask the Lord. Like, ask him to change it. Um, we're going to read Ephesians 2 it's on this screen. And this tells us about our our nastiness, if you will. Uh, as for you, this verse 2, uh, or chapter 2, verse 1, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we are by nature deserving of wrath. So, this is telling us that there's nothing you can do. And you all know this, you've grown up in the church. But like sometimes I think we have to revisit this because if anybody went to a church this morning and listened to Jim preach about Mary and Martha, we get this <coughs> syndrome uh, of, yeah, I know I believe that it's not my good works that save me, but I need to do all these things so that I appear saved because that's what you're supposed to do. And and we're gonna talk about things like that all semester, but it's only when you realize, I'm dead. I can't do anything. Um, and the Lord comes in and, and saves you. Um, so, very first part, fun, foundational to following Jesus is knowing that you're dead and asking the Lord to make you alive in Him. Um, da, 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 where am I going? We're going to move on to um, the second part of Ephesians here. So, after you're, we're dead, we know that. Um, it's at that point when we, we're in a pit of despair, kind of. It's grace that the Lord comes to us, and he shows you, and he shows me, like, you're a mess, Rach. Like, you are a mess. You can't, you cannot do anything good, even in your attempts to do good things, without me. Uh, you're a mess, and you need me. And so that's grace. When he shows me, Rachel, you're a freaking disaster. You're going to make a mess of your life if you don't, um, if you don't come and love me first. And so that's grace. But then in that, his love, I love this, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we are dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. And what's so sweet about that to me is it's grace that he shows us we're a mess, but it's also grace that picks us up out of this pit of despair of, I'm a freaking disaster, I'm faking it in church, I'm, people are going to think I'm, I'm actually a hypocrite, people think I have my stuff together, and I don't, you know, or pit of despair of, oh my gosh, I did whatever and I sh know I shouldn't have and my heart is sad about that or I really am a gossip and mean, I'm a mean person, you know, or whatever it is, this is what picks us up out of that pit of despair and says, but because of his great love for us, God, rich in mercy, brought us life and he's saying, you're, you're going to be made alive and have abundant life in me. Um, so it's out of our deadness that he's showing us who we are. So hopefully these are things that you all know, but I think it's something that in church, sometimes we dilute and we forget like the power of that. That if you're a really filthy, dead mess, and the Lord picks you up and makes you alive, what a transformation. And that that transformation is what causes us to love Jesus. 
and that's why we do what we do. It's not because we want to look good. It's not because we our friends go to <clears throat> youth group, and so we want to hang out with our friends. It's not because somebody told us that going to Revolution and feeding the poor is a good thing and you feel like a good person. It's because we love Jesus, and it's because we fall in love with him and we're grateful for what he's done. And so out of that, when knowing our inability to save ourselves and knowing that he paid the price and gave us this abundant life, we want to listen to him. We want to spend time with him. We want to follow him. We want to be like him. And so this is what, when this Sermon on the Mount comes in, and it's, it matters to us. Um, this is why it matters. If, does anybody, can anybody think of a, you've heard it said, off the top of your head, that we haven't, that is like kind of something you just said? Anyone? Any thoughts? Uh, yeah. Uh, you've heard it said, do not uh, commit murder, but I tell you that if you look at a brother with me, then you have to murder your heart. Yeah. So that's a hard one. If you've ever even so much as thought, meh, if that person cut me off, I really don't like them, or whatever your issue is, you know, or oh my gosh, this person neglected me and oh, I hate them, or, or whatever it is, those people that are hard to love, that's murder in your heart, and that is not good, you know? Um, so, so when we look at those and we see how Jesus calls us to this higher standard that's different than our the perhaps non-church culture, sometimes even different than our own church culture, we want to follow him, and we want to have hearts that are clean, um, and, and hearts that, that love him in the way we think, in the way we act, in the way we live. So that's why the Sermon on the Mount um, matters. Let's, da, 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 da. Let's go to the next slide. I really like the Christians, too, this week. Um, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourself, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. But here's where this works does come into play. For we are God's, um, well, okay, different version. I've read like four versions. We, for we are God's handiwork. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So some of you are probably paying attention, going, great, you just said works don't matter. And now you're telling me that we're created to do good works. Um, what the heck? Like, you're speaking on two sides of your mouth. Um, this is in context of knowing that it's the Lord that works in you. The Lord that prepares the works for you to do is the Lord that brings the good things out of your life because of the works. Um, a lot of times in our Protestant culture, uh, in the West, we kind of push the works away because we're afraid of sounding like you're saved by works. Um, I know I have a lot of family members and, and, and different people that I work with and, and different friends who think that if you're kind of a good enough person and you, you work your way, you do enough good things, you volunteer or whatever, you'll, you'll be saved. Um, and so we in the Protestant evangelical church, we're like, oh, we don't want to say that. We know that's wrong. So we sometimes kind of do away with it and pretend like works don't matter at all. But they do. Clearly they do because God prepared them for us to do. Um, and so it's part of bringing him glory and bringing change in the world is that we want to listen to him and we want to obey um, what he says to do. So while your prayers, your good, you know, beautiful prayers and your time at Revolution and your I don't know, whatever you do, loving people in class, doing mission, Adelante, whatever it is you do, while that will not save you, and why that does not say that you're a Christian now, um, it does matter, because the Lord is using it. After he's changed your heart, he's using you to change other people as well, and to bring himself glory. Uh, so I'm going to give you, let's go on to the next verse. Jesus tells us it matters. So Matthew 7, going back to the end of the Sermon on the Mount, this is kind of what he finishes on the two chapter long sermon. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. If you're not doing, if you don't see change, if you're not living out the things that the Lord's called us to do in the Bible, through the Sermon on the Mount and other texts, you don't have fruit, and you're and you're not listening to him. He says, everyone who hears the words of mine and puts them into practice is a wise man. You're going to build a solid house. Um, if you don't, there, there are issues, there are problems. So when... You know, your friends suddenly turn out to be real jerks, or your family members get sick, or you're just feeling really depressed 
it happens. Um, you crumble because you don't have a solid foundation of knowing the Lord saved you, but also seeing him use you as you followed him. And, and, and um, it's not like a do this and you're going to have a great happy life, but it's do this and you'll have peace and, and, and you'll be with the Lord. And so it's, that's what you want. When the storms come, you want to have peace, that you're with the Lord and you're secure and you're um, covered by his wings. You're in kind of the shelter of, and I don't know if that speaks to you all or not. I know the word shelter of the Most High God never really spoke to me um, very enough because I'm not normally threatened. Um, I'm not normally, well, I did have a dream last night that somebody threw a hand grenade at me, which was really, <laughs> 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 really scary. Um, I needed a shelter. Um, I, I don't know why. But anyway, um, so it doesn't matter. Um, I would, so I would encourage you all, and, and that it matters for you, but it also matters for the people around you. And there's definite fruit of people who fall in love with Jesus. And, and you all know how to fall in love with Jesus. You know how to love people. And it's it's not really that different. You spend time with them. You get to know them. You try to be like them because you love them. Um, and so it's like once the Lord has, if you've been convicted and you know, oh my gosh, I'm a freaking disaster, and there is no way apart from the Lord that I can do anything worthwhile with my life, I definitely am not going to be saved from any disaster or hell or any of that. When you know that, and you know that the Lord has brought you and made you alive and given you a new identity and said, you are beautiful and you're valued and you are going to be my strong warrior and you're going to do this, it makes you want to fall in love with them. It makes you want to go spend time with them. Huh? Rather than just, I said a prayer, trip, Christian box, you know, like, it's not the same. Um, so I think when you do that, you'll learn to stand. In Ephesians 6, it talks about standing firm, um, and that when these the attacks of the enemy come, we'll be able to stand because we know the Lord, and the Lord um, says when we put his, his teachings into practice, it's good for us. It's, it's great for him because he gets glory, but it's good for us. It encourages our hearts. Um, so, if we don't, we'll be kind of a kind of a mess. Um, I want to end. This is going to seem a little bit bizarre uh, because it's not doesn't necessarily go exactly with the teaching, but something I wanted to share with all of you, anyways, for a long time. This is going to be a really quick, like five minute tract um, that I heard when I was a freshman in college, and it's a picture of. What when we fall in love with Jesus, why how it changes other people. And so it doesn't go right into this part of like knowing what the Lord's done for you, although kind of. But then once you know that, which I think a lot of you do, you know that, you get it, and you're excited to it's a good picture, a good stirring of like, yes, this is why I want to keep falling in love with Jesus, and this is why I'm choosing to love Jesus since he chose me. Um so anyway, we're gonna play that really quickly and then I'll pray and then we'll so we'll play the word. We didn't test this, but we'll try. How are we looking? Mm -hmm. Okay. okay.
a place where beneficial versus permissible is clearly understood. And no one even wants the boundary line. The boundary line. We would much rather lunge out to the kingdom's cutting edge, which is heaven's arms. Sitting on his lap is fine with me. His heartbeat rhythmically puts me to rest. Not apathetic slumber that leads to poverty, but deep love that thrust us to Nineveh. For Macedonians are still calling. Ethiopians are still asking for someone to help them understand. And how do we do this? Because we look into a different pair of eyes. Not just the window in his soul, but a magnifying glass on theirs. Look again. His tears aren't clear. They don't taste like salt. They're colorful banners of the nation. And they taste like the blood that was shed for them. A tear trickles down. And I see Sherlock. Another hanging to the corner of his eye. Deep inside that tear. I see a Sudanese lady worshiping over the family that just abandoned her. Here comes three more. Canada, France, Mexico. And as he wipes his eyes, I see the colors of Morocco, Russia, Scotland, and China on the palms of his hand. Where do those tears go? They're stored in a bottle. Not just a bottle, but the bottle. The one that has held the cries of the saints of Germany. The one that has held the deep secrets of Thailand's orphans, America's addicts, and Indonesia's widows. The groans from North Korea's underground church and South Korea's prayer mountain. All in the bottle. And they're waiting for you. Waiting for me to open our hand so he can pour them out. Why would he trust us with these treasures? These precious children. Because he calls us family. He can trust them. Because we've seen the otherness of God and we've longed some more. For if you got up with the same as the rest, you wouldn't be holy. My unholiness craves your holiness, your cleansing, you, you. And in the process, we become other ourselves. And the importance of that? So many stories are being told. Find for my affections, my passions, my heart. But I refuse to be caught up in the midst of small stories that seem brilliant at the moment, but soon become vain and glory. I desire to be taken up into your story, in your great plot for me and mankind. So I leap into the chariot of fire, and I ask for humility and for courage to leave it all behind, no matter the cost. Because Lord, you deserve it, and they need it. Because I love you, and they need you. And the Spirit and the Bride are still crying out, Come, Lord Jesus! And you will. You always do.
um, in the culture, what would you say about that? And how did Jesus tell us to live? And it might be hard. It might be weird. It might be really different. It matters because we love Jesus. And because these people in this room and people all around the world matter. They matter to God. And so, um, anyways, that's just my encouragement this morning. I'm going to say a quick prayer. And then hope you all enjoy this play. Um, dear Lord, I just... I thank you so much um, for the grace that you've shown me um, that I'm a mess and that there's nothing in all of my spinning of my wheels um, in my best efforts and my best days there's nothing I can do to save myself or to bring fruit in my life or bring fruit to somebody else Lord um, I thank you for grace Did you show me that thank you for the grace that has bought me a new life Lord I thank you for um, the grace that gives me the ability to, to have fruit, um, to, to be used to spring your kingdom to earth now, Lord. Um, and I, I pray for the grace to live differently and to live the way that you call me to. And I pray that over each person here, Lord. Um, I pray that wherever they are in the, in the process of getting to know you, I pray that you would make them fall more in love with you, Lord. I pray that you would you would woo them and you would pursue them and um, that that deep love for you would fuel the way they live their lives, Lord. And it would, it would be transformational, not just for them, but it would transform their schools and their families in the city and in the world, Lord. I really pray for that and um, believe it. We love you. We thank you so much uh, for the grace that you've given us for this week, whatever's coming, whether it be tests or difficult weeks with activities or work or whatever. Yeah, we just have to go with it. Yeah. Yeah, I just have uh, two more quick announcements. Sorry, I know um, it's going to be late, but 